Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining our remote meeting this morning. This is the second seminar the New York State Center for Clean Water Technology uh, has offered. Um, and we uh, will be doing these on a monthly basis, the first Monday of every month. Uh, last May's presentation, Chris Gobler, uh, our director, um, gave a broad overview of the center's activities and what the center is doing to uh, solve uh, contamination of uh, water uh, problems uh, on Long Island. Uh, and that includes drinking water as well as uh, wastewater. Today, uh, Caitlin Asato, my colleague and I, uh, will be talking about uh, optimizing the design of NRBs, that is their non-proprietary nitrogen removing biofilters. And they're particularly effective at removing nitrogen and they remove some organic contaminants as well. So on the agenda for today, we'll first just go over a bit of basic chemistry uh, so that you understand the principles in back of our designs. Uh, then we're going to go over three and a half years of testing at the Massachusetts Alternative uh, Septic System Test Center. Uh, that center uh, uses the same wastewater for all uh, designs there. So it's an excellent place to make uh, comparative, um, uh, to do comparative analysis between different systems. Then uh, Caitlin will talk about um, residential installations in the in the actual real world and the with uh, very variable uh, wastewater influent. I'll come back and talk about some of our uh, efforts uh, to uh, for wood chip box polishing units. We'll then uh, summarize our findings and talk about future research, but. Lastly, we want to get to what all of this means in terms of impacts on Long Island water, including drinking water and uh, groundwater and marine ecosystems. So far before man invented cesspools even, about hundreds of millions of years before man invented cesspools, uh, there was a nitrogen cycle on the earth. And um, nitrogen cycles between non-reactive forms or one non-reactive non form, which is nitrogen in the air, and that's about 78% of the air around us, and reactive forms, uh, such as uh, uh, organic nitrogen and ammonia or nitrate. So in the natural world, there are uh, microorganisms, in the ocean and in the soil, which fix air, nitrogen air, into organic nitrogen, uh, which easily becomes ammonia. Um, and then there are other uh, microbes which oxidize uh, those forms of nitrogen into nitrate. And then other microorganisms which denitrify nitrate back into the air. So it's a, it's a complete uh, cycle. And until 1910, that cycle was in balance uh, uh, until man figured out uh, how to industrially fix nitrogen. And that, of course, has led to many of the problems that Chris addressed last week uh, in terms of excess nitrogen and uh, creating problems for especially aquatic ecosystems. So fixation occurs by uh, microbes in the soil and the ocean. And then on the continental shelves, um, nitrate down here is uh, denitrified back into air, um, especially in soils and continental shelves. Now, this is the exact process that our systems do. Um, we basically don't store nitrogen. We remove it from wastewater over here as ammonia or organic nitrogen into nitrate and then back into air. So this uh, diagram is a fairly simplified version. Um, in the, uh, there's a number of steps from nitrate to nitrite uh, for it to be properly denitrified. 
And one of those steps can produce nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And our center very much doesn't want to produce systems that would do that. And that's something that we are monitoring. Uh, we don't believe that it does that. And I'll get to that point further in a minute. In terms of the way our systems work, there's a septic tank that's pumped to a distribution field that overlies 18 inches of sand, that overlies 18 inches of sand and wood chips. So there's a coupled nitrification, denitrification, just like in that chart of the natural world I showed you. Now, because sites are different, they're not all the same, we have promoted three different configurations of this basic coupled nitrification denitrification design. One is a line system, an unlined system, and one has a wood chip box off to the side. Uh, we have one of each of these designs at uh, the Mass up in uh, near Otis Air Force Base at the Massachusetts Alternate Septic System Test Center. And we've had that up there for three and a half years. Uh, and in the last, uh, over the course of the last two years, we've installed experimental phase designs, uh, eight of them in, uh, in Suffolk County. So the way these systems work, um, the question I brought up earlier, are they, most of the industry looks at just removal of nitrate, which you can see down here on the uh, x-axis. This is consumption of nitrate. And as nitrate is consumed, then N2 is produced. And if there are, this particular set of data shows uh, that for every uh, milligram of nitrate consumed, uh, 0.82 uh, milligrams uh, of dinitrogen or nitrogen that's in the air are produced. So it's not quite a one for one. That's because in this lab-based experiment, uh, there's, um, uh, in this lab-based experiment, there's some uh, unsteady state conditions. So some microbes are consuming uh, some of that uh, nitrate. Uh, as well, there's a bit of error. I've run quite a few of these analyses and typically we see from about 0.8 to about 0.95. So very little room for any intermediate products uh, like uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, we've also monitored uh, these systems out in the field uh, and so far see no evidence that there's any um, uh, production or generation of nitrous oxide uh, from these systems beyond what you might expect from a wastewater treatment plant, which is very small on the order of 2% or less. And so far, it's hard to prove a negative that it would never happen, but we've seen very little evidence of it. So I'd like to discuss the specific three configurations. The, um, this is a lined NRB uh, design. So uh, it's got a, there's a topsoil, then 18 inches of sand. This chart is in centimeters, but that's 18 inches of sand, and then 18 inches of sand and wood chips. Uh, this unlined system is a, a system where there's final deposition to groundwater. In other words, we don't capture the effluent from this. It goes directly into the uh, environment. So um, Suffolk County, uh, and as any regulator would, requires that there's some soil underneath uh, systems and for drain fields they require two feet of soil. So if we have about a, a foot and a half of topsoil, a foot and a half of sand, and a foot and a half of sand and wood chips, that's about four and a half, let's err on the side of caution, call it five feet, and then we need two feet uh, above uh, any potential groundwater. So these systems would work six and a, uh, with uh, depth to groundwater of six and a half to seven or above. They would be uh, they would be fine. Uh, the line system is like the unlined system, except in two ways. One, it has a liner, as you might expect, uh, and that 
And also what's not shown on the diagram is there's a pipe that captures all of the effluent that comes out of the system and takes it up to the interface between the uh, sand layer and the sand and wood chip layer. So this layer is always saturated because there's a hydraulic head created by this pipe going up here. And then that pipe, pipe goes to final disposal. So in terms of depth requirements for these systems, you've got, call it conservatively, three foot of topsoil and sand, and then you have your pipe, and that has to go on a gradient down to final disposal, which can be either a, a leaching galley or a, a concentric uh, leaching pool. Uh, and if those are, uh, depending on the space in the uh, site, uh, you could use a four foot galley, uh, and underneath that, you need three feet, uh, before you get to groundwater. So that would be 10 foot. Or if you had the space, you could use two foot galleys and then you would only need eight foot depth to groundwater. The wood chip box variation is very interesting. We wanted, because the wood chip box is a lot smaller, a lot less volume than the layered systems. So for instance, it's about a quarter of the volume. Uh, of the layered systems. Uh, and we wanted to see if that smaller volume could continue to, uh, or could denitrify the nitrate coming out of the sand layer here. It goes from here, uh, it goes from the sand layer here, uh, down into depth position here, and then into the uh, wood chip box, which is in here. Turns out it denitrifies very, very well, even though it's a very small volume compared to the layer cakes. And I'll talk about that research that we're doing into, um, into using those with uh, IA systems in just a moment. So three and a half years of testing uh, NRB designs uh, at MASDIC. Um, what I'd like to that in, has involved a lot of research and a lot of monitoring. And I'll talk about um, three different parts of that today. I thought we could talk just about that for the entire hour. Uh, so we did a, a tracer experiment to find out the residence time of uh, the sand bed. That is how long the wastewater stays in the sand bed, how long it stays in the unlined uh, system in the online biofilter. We've done experiments to optimize the size, the footprint of these NRBs. We did that by increasing loading rates. I'll also talk about uh, spatial analysis or monitoring the changes in nitrogen with depth, and then uh, talk about uh, the seasonality of these uh, systems. So, it's a really straightforward matter to calculate the residence time of water in a tank or in a lined NRB, say. It's just whatever goes in um, you take, uh, and what comes out, you take the volume of the system and you divide it by the loading rate to get the number of days that any parcel of water would stay in that box. But if you don't have a defined system, as in the case of an unlined system, then you can't do that, what's called an HRT calculation. So what we did was we put a bunch of bromide in the pump chamber upstream of the online system at Mastic. Sodium bromide is inert. It won't affect the, um, the, the operations of the system. Uh, and then uh, we measured the bromide that came out in a lysimeter, a pan lysimeter that was underneath the sand bed, and then another one that was underneath the denitrification layer. And what we found out was that um, it takes about uh, 1.6 days that the water spends in that unlined sand bed, and another three days uh, in the uh, um, biofilter, in the denitrification biofilter of the unlined system. That's a little bit less than the, uh, in the, the theoretical calculation that we did for the uh, lined 
system. Uh, but those numbers are fairly close considering the error involved in, um, in this experiment and trying to capture the uh, F, um, percolate in a, um, in a pan lysimeter. So they're pretty close. The real difference here is with the wood chip. As I mentioned before, it's much smaller, so the water stays in there for less. That doesn't seem to have effective it, affected its performance, though, as I'll discuss just momentarily. So the experiment to um, increase uh, loading rates, we wanted to push the boundaries of, uh, of the systems to see how, uh, how high we could load them because, of course, in any county, uh, there's going to be regulators, and they, they rightly so set what's called a design flow. So any septic system has to meet a certain gallons per day uh, capacity. So you can do that either by making a bigger system to handle the flow or loading the flow in a smaller system faster. So what we wanted to do in this experiment was find out if we kept loading it at a higher rate, when would that either fail because the loading was too high? And when it did, what was the nitrogen level at that rate? So that would get us to what is the optimal size system, the smallest system we could design, in other words, and still stay, very importantly, within our center's guideline of 10 milligrams uh, per liter of nitrogen or less. I'm sure last presentation, Chris went over our 10, 10, 30 rule. And so everything I talk about today, all our systems, they're designed to get under 10 milligrams per liter of nitrogen or less. Uh, so the systems at MASDIC are uh, 12 by 28. So that's a 336 square foot system we started loading that at 220 gallons per day. That works out if you normalize the uh, gallons per day to the square foot uh, you get uh, of the system, the 336, you get 0.65 gallons per square foot per day. Well, Suffolk County for a four bedroom house, their requirement is 440. So for 440 at this, 0.65 gallons per day loading rate, you'd have to build a system that's six, 677 square feet. And our early installations at, in Suffolk County used uh, 0.75 uh, gallons per square foot per day, so very close to that. But we wanted to see, could we go load greater than that? And we want to do this, of course, over a long period of time, it, 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 not for a couple of weeks. So, uh, and especially including the winter, which is, as I'll discuss soon, the really difficult period for denitrification. So we wanted to run it over the winter. So each time we ran it for over 18 months. So what we found out uh, at 330 gallons per day, or roughly one gallon per square foot per day, then you can build a 446 square foot system if you want to hit Suffolk County's uh, 440 regulatory design flow. Our systems could do that for the line system and the wood chip box. We got basically eight milligrams of liter running not just at the lower rate, but at one gallon per square foot per day. For the unlined system, its performance was above uh, 10 milligrams. So what we're recommending to engineers and regulators based on these experiments is that for line systems and wood chip systems, you size the system, design it based on one gallon per square foot per day. If it's an unlined system, you design it based on uh, 0.75, which is the rate that we used in our early systems, which as Caitlin will tell you in a minute, our experimental systems in Suffolk are working very well at 0.75 gallons per day. When you try and load these systems, these drain fields at above uh, 1.3 uh, square foot per day, you get a, um, you reach the hydraulic capacity 
of these systems and you begin to get pounding of water. So we don't want to do that. So there should be a big X here. None of our systems are we recommending to go above one gallon per square foot per day with the current design configurations we have. This is the, uh, if you look spatially at what happens in the system. So this is the, the amount of total nitrogen in the system in milligrams per liter. And in the influent up at Mazdic, it's 43 milligrams per liter. Just percolating down through the sand filter, this is nitrified percolate. So this is captured in a lysimeter at the bottom of the sand bed. It removes on average about a third of the total nitrogen. We think that's because there are anoxic microzones in that otherwise oxic uh, layer. And if there's a lack of oxygen around, many, many facultative microbes will use the oxygen that's attached to nitrogen in nitrate for their oxygen source. They'll prefer to use oxygen directly, but they won't go too far to get it if there's a biofilm or an anoxic microzone. So we think that's what's going on here. The other interesting point about this spatial analysis is that these systems denitrify uh, nitrify really, really well. You can see all of it is in reduced forms, TKN or um, uh, ammonia or organic nitrogen here, and it's all converted, almost all converted in the sand layer to nitrate. And then in the final effluent, it stays in the form of nitrate. Now, the residual amounts, uh, this is the long-term uh, average for both performance periods over the basically the three and a half years. Uh, these, um, the, the dominant form left is nitrate. And the reason is there's some nitrate collected in the winter in these systems. So here's the seasonality of the lined and wood chip box. The unlined system would look exactly the same. Don't happen to have it up here. Here's the line, here's the wood chip box. The blue is temperature. So you can see this is winter time when the temperature goes down, summertime when it goes up, winter time when it goes down and so forth. And this uh, orange line is nitrate and the small uh, gray uh, data is TKN. So the system has almost all nitrified. It's all nitrified. It's all, uh, it's all in nitrate up here. But in the winter time, when the temperature is low, the amount of nitrate is, goes up. So denitrification attenuates. So if you want to build a more efficient system, the thing to do is to focus on how to reduce nitri uh, nitrate in the winter maybe how to provide more electron acceptors in the winter. And that is one of the things that the center is focused on currently. So with that, I'm going to turn the um, computer over to my colleague, Caitlin Asada, who has joined us and who has studiously been keeping a six foot difference from me. And um, she'll be here and I'll, go away, and uh, then I'll be back. Okay. Thank you, Stuart. Um, so uh, following the success of the systems uh, installed at Mazdic, the center Uh, continue to install nitrogen removing biofilters at various sites around Suffolk County. So these are mostly uh, at locations owned by the Suffolk County Department of Parks, along with two online systems installed at the Nature Conservancy location uh, at Uplands Farm Sanctuary. And all of these have been online anywhere from just a couple of months to two years. Um, so these were installed under experimental approval through Suffolk County's Article 19, uh, which requires uh, between two and five systems to achieve 75% uh, of systems with effluent less than or equal to 19 milligrams per liter over 12 consecutive months. 
Uh, so once that is completed and we expect the aligned and online systems to meet that requirement within the next year and the wood chip box systems uh, shortly after, uh, then we would uh, we would qualify for pilot approval. Uh, so if we have two or three systems already installed under the experimental phase, we can install between five and six additional ones to qualify for piloting. Uh, so from there, we would need to meet similar requirements over a 12 month monitoring period. Uh, from there, we would qualify for provisional approval where we would need at least 20 units installed. Uh, and the final goal there would be to get to general use approval where they could be installed anywhere in Suffolk County with uh, continued monitoring. Uh, so this is a summary of the design flows of each of the NRBs installed in Suffolk County. As you can see, they are designed uh, with flow rates well within where we would expect, uh, well below where we would expect hydraulic failures based on our experiences at MASDIC. So they are uh, fairly large in footprint right now, but we can be pretty confident that they will all perform. And as you can see from the rightmost column, uh, the couple of sites where we do have flow meters installed, the actual flows are far below the design flows, which is what they're for. So that's good. Uh, this chart shows summaries of performance of all of our NRBs uh, over the entire monitoring period. So anywhere from a couple of months to two years. Uh, for each system, we have the influent on the left and the effluent on the right. Um, and a couple of things might catch your eye about this slide. For one, the influent qualities can vary quite a bit from house to house. For example, Uplands Farm 2 has not had residents for about a year, so the quality of the septic tank affluent is a little bit different. Uh, another one that might catch your eye is Prosser Pines 1, where the, the affluent quality is uh, much higher than the other ones. So you'll notice that that one also has higher effluent quality, but on a percentage basis, it's uh, not quite so bad. Um, so this red line here is the 19 milligram per liter standard, and all of our systems except for Prosser Pines 1 are meeting that uh, standard. And this blue line is the 10 milligram per liter standard that the center uh, sets internally and all except for two of our systems are currently meeting that. Uh, however, on average, they're all, if we look at the average by the system type, they're all below 10. Okay. Um, and this chart shows a replication of one of the analyses that Stuart presented on our MASIC data. So on the left, we're looking at the water quality at the interface between the sand layer and the wood chip layer. Uh, one thing you might notice right away is that there's a lot of variation between our sites, even between the ones that are the same configuration. However, uh, we do see that like at Mazic, there is a substantial amount of nitrogen removed uh, just within the sand layer. However, it is a lot more than Mazic where we had about a quarter to a third of nitrogen removal. In Suffolk County, we have over 50%. And then if we look at the right side of the graph at the final effluent coming out of the NRBs, uh, whereas at MASDIC, most of the remaining total nitrogen in the effluent was in the form of nitrate and nitrite, so the blue section. Uh, in Suffolk County, most of our systems are producing more TKN in the effluent. Uh, so in summary, uh, most of our, our NRB installations in Suffolk County still achieve less than 10 milligrams per liter in effluent, even though the influent nitrogen was higher in most cases than at Mastic. Um, all NRBs showed a lot of nitrogen removal in just the sand layer, although the ones in Suffolk County showed a lot more. All NRBs show less nitrogen removal in cold temperatures, and the final effluent at Mazdic, most of the residual nitrogen was in the form of nitrate, and in Suffolk County, it was mostly in the form of TKN.
Uh, so with that, I'll ask Stuart to come back and present on our work with wood chip boxes. Thank you. Trying to keep six foot distance. So I said earlier in the presentation that I would talk about uh, wood chip boxes a bit more and uh, their use as polishing units for IA systems. So Suffolk County um, uh, DHS actually asked us uh, to look at uh, this um, area uh, of, of research um, because these wood chip boxes are small relative to general footprints for drain fields. Um, and the conclusions that we could draw here would be different than the conclusions about uh, hydraulic capacity or nitrogen removal performance um, in the NRVs that we talked about earlier. And the reason is here, as a polishing unit, these systems are meant, would be used for final effluent. So final effluent is already treated. So it won't have all the organic matter um, or uh, the potential to build up biofilms, which a um, what regular uh, NRB treating wastewater would have. Also, these systems uh, are smaller, so the question there were several questions. At at a high loading rate, three gallons per square foot per day. Could these? What's the smallest system that we could build? That was one question. Another was what would be the maximum loading rate for a drain field that looked like one of our NRBs uh, with a sand and wood chip, one of our layered NRBs, which have a sand and wood chip mix at the bottom. To answer these questions also involves uh, uh, looking at the optimal size and type of wood chip uh, uh, to, to, to use. So we've done uh, in our research uh, trailer some work on, on some of these questions and, and we'll do further work uh, on others. So um, to the right here is a, a screen, a screening process. This is how we determine the optimal size of our wood chips. So uh, we're, we're in the process of those experiments now um, and then for determining the size of the wood chip box itself, what we did was we constructed barrels with different volumes of wood chips. That would give you, so the larger the volume of wood chip, the larger the hydraulic retention time, the longer the water would stay in that bigger volume of, uh, or bigger barrel, bigger volume of wood chips. The barrels are all the same size. Uh, and this is a medium sized uh, volume of wood chips and a lower volume of wood chips. Well, what we found out in monitoring this since last summer is that as long as you have a residence time of one day, that's enough for denitrification. You can load it at three gallons per square foot per day. You can have a very small system, but if it's small enough to allow the residence time to go under a day, then almost immediately you compromise the uh, removal uh, or the denitrification, the removal of nitrate. So we're continuing to monitor this to see if there's any changes over time. So far, oak and pine seem to perform about the same, but we're continuing to consider this question of wood chip types as well as wood chip sizes. So our key research findings, NRBs remove nitro nitrogen to N2 gas. We haven't found evidence yet of a lot of intermediate production of 
potential greenhouse gases. Um, footprints um, for lined and wood chip box systems. We have a year and a half's worth of evidence that you can load them out one gallon per square foot per day and achieve under 10 milligrams of nitrogen per liter in final effluent, eight actually. Um, for the unlined systems, you have to build them larger because you need to load them at uh, a lower loading rate. So 0.75 gallons per square foot per day to get again, eight, but at least under 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, with the current uh, layered designs, they reach hydraulic capacity at more than a gallon per square foot per day. Uh, we get significant end removal, total end removal in sand beds, about a third. And the key to improving these, uh, to, to optimizing these systems further is to uh, design them so they perform in cold temperatures better than they do presently. And that's a challenge we're working on. And denitrification in wood chip boxes is, uh, works at high loaning rates as long as you keep under one day uh, residence time. We are still working uh, on using uh, a drain field for a polishing unit. Uh, that's awaiting uh, an installation at our, uh, our research trailer. So questions for further research, uh, how to overcome hydraulic limitations of the drain fields so that we could increase flow beyond one gallon per square foot per day and decrease system foot size. How to increase denitrification at cold temperatures. And we're looking at many different solutions for this. Um, wood, chip, uh, um, wood chips for uh, either boxes or drain fields, size and type, and we want to get more installations in the ground. We're also looking uh, for ways to improve the resiliency and reliability of these systems. Although, so far, they've been very reliable in our in-ground systems in Massachusetts and in Suffolk County. So what does the technology mean for the environment here on Long Island? Let's just go through a real simple um, calculation. Um, we know that households produce a four bedroom household on average might produce just under 300 uh, gallons per day. And we also know from uh, research literature that wastewater has on average about 60 milligrams of nitrogen per liter in it. If we take that, multiply it by 520,000 unsewered homes on Long Island, we get a lot of nitrogen percolating into groundwater, about 14,000 tons of it every year. And if you use conventional uh, ratios to account for some removal in the Vados zone or in, in, ground, in aquifers, uh, then that ratio would be about 0.5. So you get about 7,000 tons. And that's very conservative for Long Island because there's a lot of houses that are very close to the water and therefore the effluent doesn't spend uh, much time in the Vado zone or in aquifers. It goes pretty directly within one or two, you know, within a year or so out into the ocean. So that means for one milligram of nitrogen reduction, if you can reduce it by one milligram, that's gonna save you in nitrogen loading to the marine systems 160 ton, 116 tons of nitrogen per year for these houses. So if you took, for instance, the eight milligrams that we're getting in our systems that we proved we can get in Suffolk and in at Mastic, you can get rid every year of close to a thousand tons of nitrogen entering the marine systems, 950, based on these assumptions. So 
we'd like to acknowledge uh, people who have made this research possible. And Governor Cuomo started our center, so we are very indebted to him uh, for um, to be able to do this work, as well as uh, County Executive Steve Ballone. Um, have they've just put together a super uh, great program here to confront the cesspool crisis on Long Island. And Peter Scully, uh, who makes this happen on, uh, in Suffolk County. Um, Steve Engelbright and County Legislator uh, Kara Hawn have been enormously uh, helpful uh, to the center in helping us to uh, obtain uh, financing. Uh, the, the folks at uh, DHS, at the Department of Health uh, Services, uh, Justin Jobin, uh, Julia Priello, and John Sanjin uh, are great collaborators. Uh, uh, and um, also Susan Van Patten and Kuhn Tang at the New York uh, State DEC in the Water uh, Department. Um, George Hoyfelder uh, at Mazdic. I can't tell you how much I have learned from George in the last four years of working with him and how enjoyable that's been, as well as Dave Potts at Geomatrix and uh, George Loomis at URI. So uh, we're really, our thanks go out uh, to all of, all of them. And with that, I think it, we're going to take questions. So, Stuart, I have a question. Yes. Um, so you mentioned in your presentation first that all of the systems nitrified well at all temperatures, and you mentioned a few times that you noticed denitrification attenuate at colder temperatures. And you also mentioned that you have several things that you're doing in order to improve denitrification at colder temperatures. Can you, one, tell me why denitrification attenuates at cold temperatures? And two, can you tell me what you're planning to do to improve denitrification at cold temperatures? Sure, great, great question. Um, so one thing that we've, that I've noticed at Mazdic after staring at the data for maybe a bit too long, but uh, because it is kind of messy data, but it seems that, that Certainly, it's very clear denitrification attenuates at cold temperatures, but the nitrogen removal in the sand layer doesn't seem to. So if that's being denitrified in anoxic microzones, it's because it's using carbon that is in wastewater. There, isn't, are, there aren't any wood chips up in the nitrification layer. So that's a hypothesis. I haven't proved it. But if it was carbon that was in wastewater, then it's more labile. If the carbon is being supplied by the wood, you first have to rely on cellulolytic bacteria to break up the wood to allow the hydrolysis of carbon, to allow that carbon to be bioavailable to the denitrifiers that need it to convert nitrate. So maybe instead of it being a general control on the cold temperatures being a general control on nitrifiers, maybe it's really on the cellulolytic bacteria that they don't produce as much carbon at colder temperatures. If that were true, then the question is, okay, well, carbon is supplying an electron donor in this process, in the chemical reaction. So how do you supply an electron donor? So that gets to the second part of your question. And so we're looking at ways uh, to supply electron donors, whether that would be materials or even electrochemistry may have some applications here. This is all on the drawing in the early stages right now, but uh, interesting research. So thank you for that question. Are there, are there others? There, there's a couple in the chat. 
Okay. So question about wood chip sizes. Still a work in progress. What we've found so far is a couple things with wood chips. One, you don't want dirty wood chips. You don't want leaves. So really you want the wood chip processor who's chopping, uh, uh, chipping the wood to either be taking all the little branches and leaves off or to do it in the winter time. Uh, and then in terms of sizes, we've been using screens. So the installations that we've done so far, we've gone to Home Depot and we've used a eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, excuse me, screens. That seems to get rid of all the dirt uh, and you get a nice size looking wood chip. Um, they were, that was that picture on the, on the right. Uh, I didn't show a picture underneath it, uh, but you uh, of what you don't use, but that's mostly small particles. But we're still researching this question. So we may screen at an eighth of an inch uh, in the next uh, experiment. There's another question. So our first installations were very expensive. Uh, there's a huge learning curve in any design. Probably the first iPhones were pretty expensive and the first calculators were pretty expensive. So there's a real learning curve here. As we enter the pilot phase, and as Caitlin explained earlier, we're right at the precipice of doing so and we have uh, funding uh, for uh, quite a few installs. Our number one priority will be to reduce the cost of these installations so they are competitive with, uh, at, at market prices with uh, IA systems, with commercial IA systems. Okay, uh, can you explain more about what types of wood chips are used to prefer size and why is pine and oak being used? How long do they expect to last? Uh, do they break down over time? Sure. Okay. So, a couple of questions there. All, all, uh, uh, so, let me ask them uh, one at a time, uh, answer them one at a time. Uh, first, in terms of carbon longevity. So, the answer to that is that no one knows 100% for sure, but we can look at some guidance points. So um, during Sandy, this giant oak in our backyard fell over and I didn't want to, I had to pay somebody to come and um, chop it up, but I didn't want to pay somebody to grind the stump. So that stump is there and it doesn't look very much different now than it did in 2012 after Sandy. The other end members are, uh, you know, so one, one end member would to consider would be a tree that falls in the wood. And, you know, it's going to take 10 years or more for that to decay, but the carbon is still going to be in the soil. So even way more than 10 years. The, and that's in a fully oxic environment with lots of animals and insects uh, breaking that wood apart. The other side of the equation might be a Viking ship. Uh, so there was one I visited in Stockholm and a Viking king built this ship and they launched it and in Stockholm Harbor and it sank. And after World War II, they um, dug it up, excavated it and uh, brought it up to a mu museum that I visited and all of the timber is still really intact. That's because it was in an anoxic environment where there weren't a lot of bugs or microbes to break down that wood. So it broke breaks down very, very slowly. So in terms of carbon longevity, maybe the, those are the endpoints. Maybe the best, longest uh, record is up at Waterloo. Uh, Robertson et al. published a paper in 95 where they put in a, a similar wood chip biofilter that was receiving septic effluent. 
And in 15 years later, they published a paper and it was still denitrifying. And that was, um, that was in 2010. And now they're still going and it's still denitrifying. So that's 25 years already and it's still going strong. Um, the other question was on wood chip type. Why did we choose pine or oak? Uh, that's mostly what's on Long Island. Uh, but it's an interesting question as to whether maple or something else would work better. So far, we haven't found any differences at all. Um, other question? Uh, yeah, how often do the wood chips have to be refreshed or replaced? So I, that's kind of the question I was just addressing. Uh, and I think, you know, the answer from Waterloo University in Canada, again, is, is at least 25 years. Uh, but probably much longer. Our wood, if our wood chip box allows access to do that, were there to be a reason to do that? Next question. Okay, so uh, those were all the questions in the chat. Are there any more questions uh, from anyone uh, on the line who wants to ask verbally? If not, I think that's, that's the end of the presentation and I, I thank you very much all for attending.